Travis Wayne Goodsell. Uh, Egyptologist Rittner has done with John DeLynn part three of the Book of Abraham. I forgot to get to it yesterday, and then I forgot to get to it this morning, and then remembered, and then uh, found out it was five and a half hours long. My goodness. But uh, as I'm uh, scanning through it, seeing what pictures they're referring to, uh, they get to the uh, Joseph Smith alphabet and grammar, uh, that it's commonly called also the Book of Abraham Manuscript, as they're calling it. Uh, Warren Parrish is the scribe. And uh, uh, they think this is the smoking gun that defeats Joseph Smith as a fraud. Uh, uh, so I'll go over that with you again. But uh, Warren Parrish uh, to give you a little history about him, he uh, was uh, north and up the rivers uh, from uh, where the Smiths were, uh, almost up into Canada, the top part of New York, and uh, so it was quite a distance away from where. Uh, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball were at the time when they uh, were brought into the church. And uh, <coughs> uh, Warren Parrish came in because of Brigham Young. Uh, and notice that when you go to his Wikipedia page, and I'm pretty sure the church, if they talk about him, it would all only say Brigham Young. Uh, remember, Mormons, that you're supposed to go two by two? Why then is Brigham Young mentioned alone? Yeah, that's one of Brigham Young's problems, is that he did his missions alone, uh, occasionally running into Heber C. Kimball, who likewise did it alone. don't understand why they couldn't just go together. Uh, they wanted to cover more territory and convert more Danites. Uh, so, <coughs> I find it hilarious that uh, uh, the church says, oh yeah, Brigham Young was so enthusiastic about the church. Church is awesome. Church is great. And so he went back to uh, his homeland and converted all the people there. Well, they were Scottish Rites Masons, not York Rite Masons. If you remember 1826, the anti-Mason movement of which Canandaigua, New York, was the central location of which three people in American history, two of whom are directly related to LDS church history, and the third is dragged into church history as he was baptized for the dead in 1838, among the first group of those to be baptized for the dead. And then his wife uh, was later brought into the church and lived across the street from Joseph Smith in Nauvoo. And then uh, uh, they, uh, in order for her to come with Brigham Young, uh, Brigham Young had her sealed posthumously to Joseph Smith. And so, of course, the page of the Captain William Morgan only discusses the polygamy part. It doesn't discuss the baptism for the dead part, nor the part of Canandaigua. Although they mention he's from, or he's arrested in Canandaigua twice, and then the disappearance, and the anti-Mason movement that resulted, and then the Book of Mormon that came forth after his failed attempt to publish a book, or two books rather, that he was paid for by the Batavia Press, who did all of a sudden publish a book of which was not completed, but is completed with what they published. Yeah, uh, 
so when you understand the real history, then you understand what is really going on. So Warren Parish was in Scottish Rites territory, uh, but wasn't really into the whole anti-Mason revenge thing, as uh, the Scottish Rites were with Brigham Young, and, uh, and so uh, he left the church and stayed in Kirtland, and, and uh, yeah, but uh, to understand, they quote him as to the the uh, Book of Abraham manuscript, as they call it, or the alphabet and grammar, as Joseph called it. Uh, but he was a scribe for it, uh, and he says uh, that uh, I'm not going to be able to quote it. But he says Joseph said how he did it, and so he's only doing what Joseph Smith said he did. He didn't actually see Joseph do it. So he's assuming what Joseph Smith was telling him, and therefore was trying to recreate it as a scribe. And no, it's not the smoking gun, because it's not how Joseph did it. He's looking at the wrong characters. <laughs> but at first I was thinking, oh yeah, because that was something I wanted to check out and do research on, uh, but uh, uh, no, <laughs> that's not what Joseph did, it's what could be done, and I have to check and test and all that stuff, but it's not going to turn out as Warren Parrish <laughs> turned it out to be, uh, but uh, they, they mention it, they say that in the first chapter of Abraham, Joseph says, refer to the facsimile. And so, as critics of the church, and uh, not recognizing Joseph as a real translator, uh, they do uh, correctly recognize that Joseph is referring to the Egyptian document and not creating something off the top of his head, uh, as apologists try to claim. Uh, but uh, uh, they're not getting it. As, like I said, Egyptologists don't know that you're supposed to translate the facsimiles, the picture glyphs. They only translate the text. So what Warren Parrish did was what Egyptologists assume, is that you only translate the text that the picture scenes, the picture glyphs, as I call them, you just, you don't touch them. You don't do anything with them. No. Joseph Smith made it very clear. He gives an explanation for each facsimile and then does a translation of them in the Book of Abraham. And so chapter one is facsimile number one. Chapter two is from the Bible, copied and pasted. Chapter 3 is from facsimile number 3, the hypocephalus. I keep wanting to say hypocephali, is, that's the plural. And uh, <coughs> it goes into the creation story uh, because facsimile number 2 is a sphere uh, with uh, hit claims of the earth and, and uh, the universe. Involved there, so he, he calls it the universe, and uh, the center is Kol, uh, nearest to Kolob as well. Yeah, anyway. but uh, uh, yeah, so he never gets to facsimile number three. And I've gone over that with you in a video as well, and uh, he doesn't finish the full translation as he he goes over in facsimile number two. It's readily identified because he says in the explanations and also represents as also etc and also and so we can see he's recognizing that the pictures have multiple levels of translation and I've gone over that with you because I am the one who deciphered Egyptian picture glyphs and thus 
recognized. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Redner throughout, as I'm going through his videos with uh, John DeLynn, you know, that's all he says is, oh, John, he, or Joseph is just making it up, Joseph Smith, uh, uh, you know, guesses, turns this into that, and, and he's, he, he's doing it from a, a view of being an, an expert Egyptologist, but he's not doing it from a, an unbiased perspective. And that's where he goes wrong, is because he's assuming that his information is the correct information, and there is no other information that proves him wrong. As I've already proven him wrong in the other video that I did about it. Unless I did two, but I think I only did one. I waited for the second one to come out. Um, but, uh, uh, but Joseph did seem to recognize that there was supposed to be a bird hovering over Osiris, in fact, only number one, uh, because of the manner in which uh, Joseph Smith wrote. Uh, he uh, talked about two individuals, not just the angel of the Lord's presence. He talks about the Lord also, and that would correspond with Horus, uh, the prince, who is in fact assembly number three, and uh, you know, Rittner has already brushed it off as you know frivolous nonsense by Joseph Smith, so he doesn't bother to check as an unbiased person because he hasn't learned how to decipher Egyptian picture glyphs. And so, uh, and so that's what I was wanting to test: is that each character or combo characters. Uh, if they likewise could be translated on multiple levels and thus there's more translation than just the one translation in the language of the Egyptians and the learning of the Greeks. Rosetta Stone, remember? So when the Book of Mormon starts off by saying I write in the language of the Egyptians and the learning of the Jews. Joseph even calls it in the church history uh, when he gets the papyra after he had already uh, been taught Hebrew by uh, Rabbi Sykes. Uh, he says it looks like Hebrew just without the points. Well, he's referring to the biblical Hebrew text uh, from the Masoretes and uh, uh, it's the Aramaic script not the Paleo-Hebrew script, but uh, uh, the concept that I want to check is if that can be the case, uh, but uh, long train running, I gotta pack up and go, so I'm not welcome in Utah for being a translator and saying Joseph Smith was actually a translator. They don't like that here in Utah. And yet they let this guy run all over them instead. <sighs> anyway. So, yeah, I thought that was kind of kind of curious. He's, he's still pulling the same stunt. You know, I'm the professor, therefore I'm a doctor, not just a professor. <laughs> therefore, I know all. No, he doesn't. Uh, and Egyptologists don't, uh, because they've assumed from Jean Champollion that uh, only the text is to be translated, and that's where they went wrong. You got to do the whole thing, and then when you do the whole thing, then you go, hey, wait a minute, that's in the Bible. Oh, that's also in the Bible for the same picture. Oh, that's also. Oh my goodness, there's like seven or eight, a dozen. Bible stories from that one picture glyph that I've already gone over with you in the video. And, uh, yeah, they're completely clueless. And, uh, uh, D.M. Murdoch, Dorothy Murdoch, had to look up and remember her name. 
<coughs> his uh, uh, a fellow uh, scholar at the same time that I was making this discovery, uh, having deciphered Paleo Hebrew already, and uh, Gary Greenberg. 101 Myths of the Bible also was involved in this. I think he might be dead also, or he's too old to do much of anything now. Uh, but Dorothy definitely died in 2015 on Christmas, and Christians cheered. So Christ-like. But uh, uh, she couldn't develop it into a theory. She just spouted off whatever knowledge came to her mind or going over stuff. So like, did Moses exist? She says no. Yes, he did exist. He just existed in multiple historical figures that were a composite into one in the Bible called Moses. The 18th dynasty forever. Or for example, uh, every single pharaoh uh, who was called David had Moses also. Uh, <laughs> that's because that's the Paleo-Hebrew phonetic equivalent, which is, yeah. so the first one was Yah, as in the God Yah of the Hebrews, that's why, it's because Yah Moses was the founder of the 18th dynasty who chased out the Hyksos and uh, began a new dynasty, and uh, you have the David Moses, that's why it's called the uh, David Moses dynasty, or the David dynasty, uh, uh, David Mo yeah, David Moses, I'm thinking in translation into Paleo-Hebrew, uh, into English, and, uh, it's, uh, the Thutmosid dynasty is what it's technically referred to, <coughs> which is the Egyptian god Thoth, uh, who was David. Uh, and you go back all the way to the beginning where he helped create the 365 day a year calendar uh, with uh, Adam and Eve. Eve being pregnant, Heavenly Father, the breath of life, Shu, uh, was told by Atum to separate. Gotta keep them separated. <laughs> And uh, so she wasn't able to give birth, as he was too late to keep him from getting getting her pregnant. And uh, Thoth came in and said, hey, I got an idea. We're going to add five days of the calendar, and therefore you'll have a child born every day. <laughs> Yay. And so, yeah, that's why Abraham tells his sister, wife, tell them you're my sister. As J. Abraham or uh, Joseph Smith talks about uh, in uh, chapter one, is that uh, the blood of Canaan has to be passed down to every pharaoh. Thus, he has to marry his sister. And he knows that, but he's not bothering to do the full research with an unbiased view. So he just dismisses everything, and he just doesn't. He even says, oh, "I never even knew about this book of Abraham alphabet and grammar or manuscript." And uh, I, you know, when I saw it, oh, I I knew exactly. <laughs> what I forgot what he called it—the shooting gun or whatever, smoking gun. Wasn't that the X Files group, the smoking guns? I can't remember now. Uh, it's gonna bug me, but uh, I thought I'd fill you in on what they've been going over here. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. They got some third guy who doesn't have a picture. I guess he's on the phone. I don't know. But uh, yeah, they they're clueless. They go with what little knowledge has already been shared. And like I said, Rosetta Stone. That's where it comes from. You know, the language of the Egyptians in the learning of the Jews. Because an alphabetical language is not Egyptian. Egyptian is not an alphabet. And so to impose Greek onto the Egyptian, yeah, no. No. 
the Greeks tried to turn it into a spoken language. And that's why I uh, suspect that uh, <coughs> Bible authors were trying to uh, tell the story in their language from what they saw in the pictures. And that's how Joseph Smith did it. He says it right there in chapter 1. Referred to facsimile 1 at the beginning of the book. People think they're smart, and because they think they're smart, they make mistakes. They pass over things, and they get caught with the virus of stupidity.